birds are singing there. Good evening, my friends. Welcome to my backyard and welcome to Pastor Garricky's study. We're here to talk to you about what does it mean to have a Lutheran community? What's it mean to be part of a Lutheran community? Why you should think about coming into a Lutheran community. Um, we have Pastor Andrew Garricky here from Mount Calvary Lutheran Church in Omaha, Nebraska. And he's agreed to talk to us about Lutheran, uh, Lutheran community because pretty soon we're coming up on Reformation Day, October 31st. And that, of course, is a celebration of all the things that we'll be discussing tonight. Let's begin, shall we? Hi, Pastor Garricky. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, Pastor Dewing. It's good to see you again. I'll be looking at you to kind, of, to kind of read you, but also interacting with my audience. Audience, if you have anything that you'd like to add in um, comments or questions, I think I can see those here on my <clears throat> on my computer. But I'm going to make sure I have my Facebook page open as well so that I can check them out. Your comments will be valuable. Your questions will be very valuable to us because we can address them here live. Now, Pastor Garricky. Number one question that I think I get from people who are new to a Lutheran church or a Lutheran community is, Lutherans, aren't they like Catholics? And I want to ask you, how would you go about explaining the reason it does appear that Lutherans are like Catholics? Yeah, uh, I guess I'll give a short answer at first. That's because um, as confessional Lutherans, uh, and that is Lutherans who hold to what the official public doctrinal statements of the Lutheran Church contain. Uh, the Lutheran Church is the Catholic Church of the West gone right. Um, so as Lutherans, we don't reject um, everything that happens between the death of St. John around the year 100 and, you know, October 31st, 1517, when Martin Luther nails the 95 Theses to the door of the Castle Church in Wittenberg, uh, that we gladly receive and retain uh, much of the heritage of the church uh, and that the goal of the Lutheran Reformation is simply to uh, cleanse the church of what is against the scriptures, but freely receive uh, much of the good that came before 1517 as our very own. So much of the formal liturgy that we use as Lutherans or the vestments or the hymns uh, that we retain the creeds, you know, the first three writings in the book of Concord, what Lutheran congregations and pastors pledge themselves to as their their public teaching. First three documents in there are the three ecumenical creeds. Um, so this is a, a repeated statement of the early Lutheran reformers, you know, Philip Melanchthon especially, again and again, uh, says in the first public statement of the Lutheran faith, the Augsburg Confession, right, that we have introduced no novelties uh, and that we actually maintain the, the practices and the customs and above all the doctrines of the Christian church sure. better than the opponents. Yes, I, you know, there's, you've said a lot more there than I think most people um, touch upon when they see, when they see maybe a Lutheran church, they see, well, you've got stained glass, <clears throat> Lots of times, right? A lot of a lot of Lutheran churches were built in a time in the U.S. where stained glass was still very popular. And if you go back to uh, the homeland of Lutheranism, yeah, you're going to have a lot of stained glass. You're going to have the pastors dressed like Catholic priests. You might have the, the pipe organ instruments that you won't really find in a lot of other places. Not not a lot of bars have pipe organs, although some do. But <clears throat> those are the things that really kind of strike a person at first glance to say, yeah. well, this doesn't look like, it, it doesn't look the same as people doing this and that and the other, but it, at the same time, there's something different here. Um, 
what would then become a marker to say, yeah, we're we're like a Catholic community, but we're a little bit different. And here's why. What would you say could be yeah. something that strikes a person as different? And, and why would it feel different? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Um, and this very point came up during the Reformation era where in many places you wouldn't know you were in a Lutheran church as opposed to a Roman church, except you got to the point where the, a sermon was preached. And I think that is still the case today. Now, our Roman Catholic friends, um, since the 1960s, they have recovered the prominence of preaching. But what you will hear in a Lutheran sermon is a very clear proclamation of the gospel. That is the death of Jesus Christ, God's son, come as a man in time to live the only perfect and holy life that a human being has ever lived and who shed his blood for all humanity, uh, appeasing the wrath of God for our sins and that he rose again from the dead and that in that event, God declares all humanity justified, reconciled to him through the death and resurrection of his son and that this is what <laughs> merits and gives us salvation. <clears throat> that is the essence of a sermon, is what you're saying, right? That's the essence of preaching the gospel. <clears throat> yeah, and it's also what will come through in what, what I think is the crown jewel of Lutheran worship, and that is our hymnody. The Lutheran chorales preach, uh, again, this very clear and most important of all messages again and again and again. So Lutheran music, <clears throat> Lutheran music is this is a part of a Lutheran community. Um, what's Lutheran music sound like? Um, well, if any of your viewers are familiar with Johann Sebastian Bach, um, much a little of bit his probably. Music, yeah, <laughs> much of his music. Uh, Bach was a Lutheran, a, de a very devout <laughs> Lutheran. Um, and much of his music was written for use in the Lutheran church. So like all of his cantata, many of his, most of his cantatas were written uh, based on the annual cycle of <laughs> gospel readings in the church year. And uh, a central piece of those is the, the chorale, the hymn uh, that was typically associated with that day. Uh, so Bach wrote many, many settings of, of the Lutheran hymns. Probably the one that even many non-Lutherans would be familiar with is Luther's hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Mm -hmm. um, so <laughs> it's based on the scriptures. Luther, in this case, bases that hymn on Psalm 46. Uh, and yet he, 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 he paraphrases it in such a way to, to preach it uh, to the Christian congregation, even as they sing it. Uh, with, a, with a rousing, lively melody that very easily uh, ingrains its, those, those words uh, in the heart and, and mind of the person who sings it. Yeah, I think it's an important to note that the, the Lutherans sing. Uh, I mean, Bach, when you think of Bach, you might think of a choir, like a more or less professional choir, or um, <clears throat> an ensemble of instrumentation that are professional or what whatnot. But if you pay attention to what Bach is doing, you can hear when the, it's like a gang choir. Everybody's singing the same melody at the same time, which was an indicator of that the whole church knows these songs. Yeah. And they're not too hard to sing. And you grow up singing them and you sing them as loud as you can because they preach yeah. the gospel. They preach the good news. The best thing we have is to preach it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I mean, this whole corporate singing thing, I mean, it's it was a bedrock of many many cultures even american corporate cultures. singing yep um and much of that has been lost in most places really the only yeah. place that yep. we still have it is if you go to a baseball game and what do you get you get the seventh inning stretch and you sing take me out to the ball take game. me out to the ball game unless Absolutely. that's been banned for some reason i don't know i'm, I'm not up i don't that. know but so you come to a lutheran church and there you have really a, a very lively vestige a remnant of this great tradition of just corporate singing that we just as a country, as a people, as a civilization really have. 
yeah, it's um, you're right. I singing together out loud, singing in in harmony. I mean, we sing happy birthday too. It's another one that people still will sing together. But yeah. man, yeah. what if day in and day out, you could sing with your family, with your with your wife and your children. You could sing these songs that <clears throat> are are actually profound in their utterance of truth, their utterance of love, of faithfulness, of uh, steadfastness in the face of adversity. Yeah. We need to give our kids presence of song. And uh, because there's all kinds of songs out there, right. which will work their way in. I wanted to ask more of that question. What do Lutherans do? We, we can talk about kind of what they look like, what the church, what the building looks like, what, what the candles and the, the, the songs sound like. But <clears throat> what else do Lutherans do when they leave church on Sunday morning? Because that's where the world will see them. Yeah. As they um, are. Well, a big word with Lutherans <laughs> is vocation, which simply means calling. It comes from the Latin word vocare, to call. And that is to say that every single Christian has callings uh, bestowed on them by God. So first and foremost, every Christian has a calling in the church. Uh, that we are called to be his people through our baptism that joins us to Christ. It joins us to one another. Uh, that calling has uh, you know, duties, expectations uh, for the Christian but then also, uh, as, as you mentioned, when we leave this place, uh, we continue to live as Christians in our other callings, particularly our callings in our family, right? That God <laughs> gives everybody a family. Everybody has a father and a mother. Many of us have brothers, sisters. Uh, many of us, we ourselves are parents and have children, and that there are duties that God gives us to serve in those in those ways uh, and then also outside of the family in in the world in the workplace as a boss or a supervisor or as an employee or worker as someone who serves in civil government or as a citizen there too uh, you're in those positions because God has placed you there and he expects certain things of you there and that as Christians, we seek to know what those things are. What does God want of me as a citizen? Uh, so that when I see uh, some terrible crime or injustice, how do I respond to that? Knowing just as a human being that injustice is wrong, that, that crime and inhumanity is wrong. How then do I respond? Is it by just getting angry and then just adding sin to sin, and that is trashing somebody else's livelihood who had nothing to do with it? Or is it, I could still get upset, but then as a citizen, petition the government, work in the community, talk to my friends and neighbors and family members about how to raise concern and awareness to hold public leaders and civil servants accountable. <laughs> Um, and so the Christian in, in all these sorts of things, in their family life, in their workplace, in just living out in the world, uh, being the baptized child of God seeks to know what does my heavenly father desire of me? How can I serve him? How can I glorify his name and serve my neighbor, not myself? Wonderful. I think what, what I see you doing there is kind of putting putting my the identity that I have as a forgiven baptized person, a child of God. I, I already have all of the love of God um, for me. <clears throat> you put that first and then you're able to be free yeah. to share yeah. the truth and the love of God with the whole world, the neighbors around you. But I think I find outside of this Lutheran core of understanding, this biblical core of vocation is the deception that I have to somehow make myself a good person, prove myself in the eyes of the world that 
that I'm righteous, <clears throat> that I'm one of the good guys. And so there's just this scurrying of, uh, of, of activity that really has very little direction to it. But trying to prove that I'm a good person because at my core, that's what makes me afraid is that I'm not good enough. I haven't done enough. Whereas, as you, as you describe it, because I have Jesus' forgiveness of sins, I can really do it for that person. I can really seek justice for the oppressed and not just to make myself feel better about it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, I guess this is more typically discussed under the terminology, you know, good works, right? What, what are the good mm -hmm. works that a Christian is called to do? And a Christian is called to do good works. Sometimes that's a, a mistaken idea about Lutherans is we don't want to talk about good works. Well, we do because the Bible does. Um, you know, we usually think good works is like something that is um, publicly seen and that would be known by anybody who sees it as, oh, that's a really good work. So we can think about, you know, philanthropy, um, you know, being a, a donor of some significant sum or a large amount of material goods, uh, mm -hmm. you know, things like that, that the world would see. The, the key insight that, that, that Luther brings is he just talks about the daily life of the Christian. So, you know, the Christian mother who just takes care of her children through the course of the day. Again, something in the Middle Ages that was looked down. It's like, oh, well, that's not very impressive, very holy. That's also looked down today for very different reasons. Not because people think, well, living as a, as a monk in a cloistered life is really holy, but just the denigration of, of, of being a wife and a mother. It's like, oh, well, that's, I mean, that's just horrible and awful. Like, no, that's, that's what God expects of a Christian wife and mother. And that he sees that nobody else may see it. Her children may be screaming their heads off at her all day just because she wants them to eat broccoli so that they're healthy. And yet that is the work that, that God values and treasures. <clears throat> the, <clears throat> right. Uh, the simple service in, uh, in our daily callings. In life. I mean, that's, that's where I hear Jesus' first sermon in Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. He says, your good works should not be seen it should not be something that you do to be seen but make it so that even you yourself don't see that you're doing them uh, jesus says if you give to be seen if you pray to be seen if you fast to be seen all right you'll be seen and that's your reward it's not yeah. coming from god but it's coming from the people that see you yeah <clears throat> the good works that um that and yet we see in in martin luther's day of course it was about um, how many pilgrimages were you able to make? How many shrines were you able to visit? If you could be a monk or a nun, shave the top of your head, wear a scratchy cloak, sleep on a stone floor. These things, because they are difficult, they must be, they must count towards something. Yeah. And they're very visible, right? You can tell just by looking at, yeah. oh, they're a monk. Oh, they've devoted their life to God. Oh, he's gone on the, the pilgrimage to St. James in Compostela, Spain. Ah, there's a really great... Right. You can yeah. tell just by looking. Right. That's right. Which is a um, big temptation today as well. Absolutely. And can you tell us more about that? What would be the the um, equivalent today? Yeah. Uh, you know, there are many. There, there's a big concern in, in our nation today for just causes, seeking justice, righting wrongs. And many of those movements, I mean, they're very visual. Yeah. Um, and that simply placing yourself where that is seen, right? You're then, uh, deemed by those who see you as righteous, right? We typically don't use that word, but that's really what's going on there mm -hmm. is the art of self-justification. How do I make myself acceptable in the sight of others? The question, I mean, the fundamental question is who's sight above all others should we be concerned about being acceptable in and for many many people even many christians who, that 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 one person is god is easily pushed out of the margin um and so there there's that call to realization and repentance that really there's only one person we should be afraid of and that's god 
Mm-hmm. I mean, that can be, that's a huge challenge. It's, it's a challenge on one hand to say, you got to back out sometimes of the light, back out of the limelight, let God do his work in you. Whereas your works can be, you must condemn your own works as worthless. But at the same time, if it means only be afraid of God, then that also pushes us to be brave and to be bold. Because if I do oppose the, the, uh, customary narrative that surrounds me, if I oppose what everyone tells me is the right way of doing something, um, there will be consequences. There'll be a price to pay. And we think of, you know, people might know Martin Luther's speech uh, the, the, when he says, here I stand, right. which we don't really know if he said, here I stand. But that moment he confessed, he said, unless I am convinced by the scriptures that you are right. Right. My conscience is kept captive to the word of God. And it's not right for me to go against this. It's not safe. So, I mean, I, I have to fail to quote him at this point, but the, the sense was, I can't do anything else but stand on God's word. And if that means all chaos has to break loose, all hell has to break loose. If that means everything is thrown into confusion and hatred and opposition, I'm on the one thing that I'm sure of, right. and I know it's going to be all right. Right. So in my mind, the Reformation, and this is where the power, the power of the gospel is there to, to make kingdoms crumble on earth, is that the word of God, when it, is, when it is taught in its purity and in its truth, has the power to throw everything into confusion because it is the only thing that lasts. Yeah. And so... Lutheran Reformation, uh, the Reformation phenomenon in history, which we pray would continue to go on and throughout our, our time as well, is that sense that um, absolute freedom to say what is true and absolute servitude to say it to everybody. You've got to say that you got to tell the truth to everybody. But this truth will set you free and set your hearers free. Yeah. And, you know, what's, what's very important to remember is that that truth is, is what's found in Holy Scripture. Um, in, in many places, that concept of truth has just been pulled out, separated away from the Scriptures. And so yep. in many places, to be a Lutheran is simply well to just take up Luther's act of confessing or speaking truth to power, as Luther did. The big thing is the content the content exactly oh, luther confess yeah yeah and i was that's just what's... Talking, i was i was just talking to my catechism students yesterday um we looked at the account in uh, in the book of acts chapter 5 where the apostles are brought before the sanhedrin and they're they're beaten and told not to preach in the name of jesus anymore uh and i just asked my catechism students what other powers in the course of history they could think of that have tried to dissuade or even destroy the church outright and then you know so we had a nice bulletin board list of them and then i went all right how many ancient romans do you know uh is uh, are there still christians in france after the french revolution mm-hmm. where is hitler's thousand year reich uh are we still shaking in our boots about the ussr sending nukes over you know and uh, history has consigned to the dustbin all these forces and powers yep. and people that have tried to cow the church into silence and and destruction. And the church <laughs> lingers on because the church stands on the word of God. Mm-hmm. I like that word lingers on because it could be hanging by a thread. And that's, and that's okay. Jesus said, do not be afraid, little flock because the father is pleased to give you the kingdom. It's a little flock. Yeah. You know, we're not, we're the Christian church is never has visions of like overrunning the planet and building itself an empire. When that does happen, it's, it's a mixed bag. It's not, it's not a Christian thing perhaps. Yeah. I mean, and the great thing though is, as a Christian, you're always a part of that flock. So again, yeah. you know, back to your 
basic question for tonight's discussion, you know, what is a Lutheran community? You know, I serve a, a very small congregation. We're, it's less than 200 members here in a town of, I mean, the Omaha Metro is close to a million. I know that's a drop in the bucket for you and your viewers in the, in the land of uh, LA. But, um, you know, especially in these latter days, uh, to, to be a, a Lutheran who confesses the, the essence of the Reformation and the, the truth of God's word can be a very lonely thing, but a Christian is never, a, a Christian who confesses these things is never alone. That's right, yep. Uh, that we're joined to many others, and not even just those gathered in the, in the congregation with us, but, you know, also to, to the whole company of heaven. You know, a Christian never prays, my father. It's always our father. I love what you say in identifying the, the content. I mean, Lutherans, they go back and forth. People say, are they Protestant? <clears throat> and <clears throat> sometimes they don't always look or feel Protestant. The question is, do they protest something? Because uh, protesting is, um, is that speaking truth to power or speaking something to power, whether or not it's always the truth, it's it's an opinion that um, can have a lot of traction. But that's not the same as confessing Christ, which goes directly to the heart of the question at the beginning, how am how are we right with God? And the it does have the power to upset a lot of things because there are whole systems that are based on the assumption that we are right, we're good people because of because of this, because of fill in the blank, what we do. And if we come around saying, actually, you're good people, uh, you're not good people at all in yourselves, but on account of a man who bled and died on the cross, by faith in him, you can have everlasting life. That will upset the system if we keep pushing it. But again, it's not the same as um, the kind of culture of protestation that as you say, has become very visible with, um, yeah. in its work. Although it does not to say that the work cannot be done with that very movement or with those movements. It's just um, Lutherans are not protesting for protest's sake or for any cause, but for this one truth that we have forgiveness of sins by faith in Christ alone. Right. <clears throat> So can you tell us about how, how does the person who has faith in Christ, what, what happens to them that causes them to, to live in a new way? Oh, well, as St. Paul says, I mean, uh, you're not your own. Um, we live in a very individualistic, me-centered culture. Um, it's kind of the, the joy and the curse of, you know, capitalism, you can have it your way. And we, we kind of live in midst of even where you have, uh, have it your way Christianity. <clears throat> um, but when you're brought into the life of Christ, that means you're no longer living for yourself. Uh, you live, to, to paraphrase a part of our liturgy, right? You, you live in faith toward God, wholly dependent on him, not fearing what any man can do to you. Uh, and you live in fervent love toward, toward your neighbor. I mean, especially towards your fellow Christians, right? That's your real family. Um, but then also to those whom you encounter wherever you are. Um, and that's not something, you know, it doesn't instantly happen when an adult is baptized or received into the church through confessing their faith. Um, it doesn't happen once you're confirmed at whatever age the congregation practices confirmation. This is really the, the life that we're continually growing into and we stumble and we fail. And by Christ's mercy and forgiveness, we get up and 
forge our way ahead in him uh, through that dying to the self and rising uh, and, and living before God in who we are in Christ, faith in him and love for one another. Very good. We had a, uh, had a, a gentleman email me some awesome questions yesterday. And he says, well, what's, what's your view on how we, what's your view on how we can obtain eternal life with God in heaven? And, you know, he's like um, thinking about this stuff, definitely not committed to any answers at this point. Mm-hmm. But behind his question is how can, how can you say that faith in Jesus is all it takes and say that to like a serial killer? or a Nazi or whatever, how can that person just by having faith in Jesus be saved? And that's, that was one of, you know, the, that's the continual, the continual question posed to clarify what do we mean by faith? Yeah. And yeah. Uh, there's a lot of confusion about that word. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. As though, well, faith is the one God pleasing work that we can do. That actually, uh, you know, the, the thing we're big about as Lutherans is that faith saves not just because it is something in and of itself, because faith is so great a work. Faith saves because of who that faith is in. Faith saves because of its content, right? Who is your faith in or what is your faith in? And so to those, you know, those questions, you know, those examples, um, well, it comes down to do you believe that Jesus is the son of God who died, right? So God bled, shed his blood and died. And that because it's God doing that, that that is enough for all humanity. If that is true, which we believe it is because the guy who did that came alive again, made himself known publicly that shows that the sins of all the world are taken away. Right. And the person who believes that the person who has faith in like, as you said, there's misunderstandings of faith. Faith is not just an intellectual assent, even to say, I believe that Jesus died for the whole world. Right. Faith is a divine work of God in which the Holy spirit dwells in your heart such that you act heart, you heartfelt uh, rely upon this man Christ as your yeah. refuge. That you rec- it's that you recognize that Jesus died not just for the whole world, but for you, for me and my sins. That that my sins cost him his life. How dare I continue then in this wickedness which sent my Lord to the cross? And so God works in that faith a true fastening of of Christ to me internally that like Jesus says, you can tell a tree by its fruit. Uh, The faith comes first. A good tree is planted and then it bears good fruit. A bad tree will bear bad fruit. Yeah. Um, And I mean, and when we're talking with our Roman Catholic friends and maybe some of them are watching, you know, what's often brought up in conversations with them and in, in, in regards to this topic is, you know, in James chapter two, where it says, uh, you know, faith without works is dead. And so that because of this, then you're not saved by by faith alone. You know, and I always when that comes up, I always ask, so what is James saying there? Is he saying that the problem then is that if you don't have works and that your faith is dead, well, that the answer then is going out and doing works and then you're fine. No, the problem is that with the lack of works, it's shown that they don't have faith. There's no faith there. Right. That, That is his point. He says, look at Abraham's faith. Abraham had faith, and by faith, he did this. Look at Rahab's faith. By faith, this is what she did. You don't correct the problem by trying to work on the fruit. you got to change the tree before you change the fruit. That's what he's talking about there. Of course, it's a miracle. Only God can plant this tree of faith. So, I mean, that's a simple reason. Anyone with faith in Christ does not is not a serial killer. Anyone with faith in Christ renounces their, their doctrines of genocide, right? <clears throat> Which does happen. 
yeah, tell us. Um, well, I mean, a very, very famous example. Uh, many people hopefully are familiar with the Nuremberg trials, uh, where after World War II, the top Nazis that were captured by the Allies were put on trial for uh, crimes against peace, you know, seeking to wage uh, unjust war, crimes against civilians, crimes against um, various ethnicities. Um, and about half of them had a Catholic background, half had a Protestant background of one side towards one type or another. And those of the of the non-Catholic background were served by uh, a Lutheran army chaplain, mostly because he could speak German. Um, and he ministered to these men in their last, I can't recall if it was months or if it extended to years, um, and you know, called them to, to repentance. And there were some who heard that. There were some who said, well, I'm kind of interested as a, you know, just hedge my bets in case you know, this whole Christianity thing turns out and, and there, there was a word of rebuke for them. Uh, but, uh, this, this pastor shared, uh, some, I don't know if he actually wrote memoirs, but, uh, shared, a history of, uh, how some of these men, um, guys with names that would be very well known to war and history buffs, um, confess their sins, confess their faith in Christ, and uh, before they went to the gallows for their crimes against peace and against humanity, uh, they received Christ's body and blood. Uh, many people would take umbrage with that, you know, kind of the mm -hmm, mm -hmm. example you gave from the email you received from this gentleman. This is really, uh, when I tell this, give, share this account, um, and, and I encounter that, that objection, uh, I go right to Luke 15. And the parable that Jesus tells about the man with two sons and the youngest son is an absolute scoundrel. It says, you know, dad, I don't want to wait for you to die. Give me my inheritance of the will now. So he does. The father does in grace, gives him all these good things, just as he gives all of us. And the younger son goes off to a foreign country, squanders all he has on riotous living. Famine comes. He's starving to death, longs to eat you know, the slop of pigs. And he's brought to the realization that back home in his father's house, that even the servants have plenty to eat. So he comes to the realization that his father is not an angry tyrant. He's not vengeful, that he even gives his servants bread to the full. So he goes home and Lo and behold, his father's been waiting for him, runs out to his son before his son can even get a word out beyond saying, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm not worthy to be called your son. He doesn't get to bargain his way back to his father's house by being a servant. The, the father just puts a new cloak on him, sandals on his feet, the ring on his, on his hand and throws a feast and celebrates. And where's the older son who stayed around all those years, was faithful? Well, he's out in the field, gets wind of this, and he's torqued. He's angry at how the father could receive such a such a slime ball of a son back with joy. And the father, again, in his love and mercy, beckons now to the older son. Right? All that I have is yours. He's lacking nothing. And that he is bid to rejoice for his brother who was lost, is found, who's dead, is alive again. He's back. And that is how we as Christians then see every sinner who repents. That's right. I mean, tells us there is more joy in heaven from the angels over one sinner who repents and over 99 righteous who need no repentance. Yes. I mean, you could say then that the, the, truly, the truly enlightened community of Jesus is the church is the, the ones is the place you go when you know there's no there's nothing else you can do there's no there's no other place you can go if you feel that you are beyond love if you're beyond god's acceptance you go to the lutheran church yeah. because that is where you'll find other sinners yeah 
And we daily we train ourselves and we discipline ourselves to be more and more like that father, more and more like our father in heaven who, uh, who loves sinners just for the sake of Christ who shed his blood for them yeah. and for us. Yeah, I mean, and for those just that feel absolutely alone, uh, guilty, beaten up by what they have done, whether it's in the recent or distant past, um, you go to a Lutheran pastor, you ask, you know, can I talk to you and share what's bothering you? And and he will ask, give you uh, these wonderful words, ask you if you believe that the forgiveness that he speaks is God's. Because God sends his pastors to speak these words to sinners who feel this way. And in answering yes, he'll then put his hand on your head and speak the words of absolution, of forgiveness, in the name of the God who sent him to speak those words. Not because the man in, in and of himself has any power to do it, but because Jesus really has died for all the sins of the world. And he sends his church out to give what he has won, his gospel treasures, to poor, terrified sinners who have no other hope or consolation or refuge. That's right. It, the forgiveness is there. It just, it is what it is. And it's it's there for, available for everybody. Now, one other problem that I think people deal with is that they mix they mix up this sense of their worthiness with not just what they have done in in sin, but what's been done to them, yeah. how they've been sinned against. I mean, there's so many people who are um, they're just they're not integrated fully anymore as a person because of what they've experienced, uh, whether abuse or uh, verbal, physical, emotional, spiritual, and so they either feel like they that they're worth nothing, even if even if they do think that they're actually a good person, they still think it's that's not for me because um, because I don't care how how they do things there. I forget how I'm trying to say this now, but what a person does can drive them away from God. What a what something can be done to them can yeah. really cause them to stumble, as Jesus would say. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, that's what Jesus says. If you if you cause any of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for for you to be drowned in the sea. Yeah, with a millstone around your neck, right? Yeah. So you <laughs> you're not coming back up out of that one. Yeah. Um, and so I know Lutherans have traditionally had schools for children, knowing that these little ones and little ones could mean anybody with little faith, but especially these literal children, that these are precious to God. Lutheran churches have traditionally had Lutheran schools attached to them, knowing that the learning of Christ must begin instantly as that child grows. And so I, th I think that's one more aspect of the Lutheran community is that there's always teaching happening and it's, it's always geared toward kids. Yeah, There's I mean, kid, kid, kids on. and, and uh, you know, I always, I like to quote one of our professors from seminary, uh, Dr. Cameron McKenzie, uh, who said, geriatric ministry is where it's at. Tell us more about that. Well, that is not just for the young people, but uh, uh, even the, those of, of much older vintage who must continually learn to become as children. Yeah. The, yeah. The, the teaching never ends. Yeah. That's right. When I was younger and preparing to be a pastor, you always I always got the question, are you going to be a youth pastor? Because I was young and I would say I want to be the pastor for anybody and for everybody. And, you know, seeing meeting with those uh, elders, either in a care center or in their homes with their caregivers or in the hospital or in hospice there you get a real flavor of how this faith endures that this faith which they were given when they were children has not failed them but in fact as, as things have been taken away from them their mobility uh their spouse their children have moved on their health is now gone yet they still have the Lord's prayer. 
-hmm. And if you bring them the Lord's Supper, they will confess their sins with you and receive what they believe. Um, yeah, I mean, even remarkably, I mean, I, I myself have have experienced this, I'm, I, and I know many other pastors have, where even uh, not just their physical ability or their 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 physical health, uh, but you know, even mentally, mm -hmm. where I mean, not only do they not know who I am because. I'm the new young pastor. I mean, they know I'm a pastor because of how I'm dressed, but they may not even know their family. And yet in speaking the word of the Lord to them, especially the prayer that he taught us, the words by which he gives us his body and blood, uh, something clicks in that weakened, disease racked brain. And uh, they're right there with the words. That's what we want. We pray that when we're at that point as well, that there would be somebody to come and pray with us and preach the gospel again to us. Because it's, that's the thing that will never change. There was a pastor who said, you know, if you, if you meet somebody and, and, um, and they're not really taking what you do very seriously, you just look them right in the eye and you say, it never changes. It's never going to change. And they'll laugh a little bit at first, but you just look them straight in the eye and you insist it's never changing. And they'll start to get what you're saying. Um, that, you know, there is eternity in this promise that Christ has. And it's, it, it does suffice for you because we have the cross. We have the death of Christ there. Unlike anything else, you can believe that it's actually true. It's not just an imaginary um, nirvana of eternal life that you can get if you work at it or if you're healthy enough. It's, this is something that's here and it sh should be here. Just as God made you for free, he also gives you this promise for free. And it never changes. Yeah, it's, yeah and it's, I mean, it's not nirvana. It's not escapism either. Um. Sometimes there's the critique that, uh, you know, Christians are so heavenly minded, they're of no earthly good. That we're so focused on the life hereafter. Um, but I think, I think part of this is, is just recognizing, right, even what Jesus promises us when he comes back. Um, right, it's not that when we die, we escape this world, we leave our yucky useless body behind and now the souls in heaven forever no jesus promises that when he comes back right the bodies of all the dead will rise so i mean luther talks about how he's going to be a great nice maggot sack for the worms uh well that big fat maggot sack full of worms is going to be raised brought to incorruption immortality the whole world will be purged with fire and yet renewed, right? That's what Jesus says. He says, behold, I make all things new. Uh, so we as Christians look not towards escape, uh, but reconciliation with God and having that, we long for the promised restoration. Yeah, the way it was meant to be and yeah. better. Right. There's there is this this error out there that says, well, if you believe in, you know, if you believe in eternal life, that's escapism and you will you will certainly disregard the real needs of poor people today because all you're thinking about is heavenly things, which is perhaps what you said. Christians are so heavenly minded. They're of no earthly good. But the reverse we find is absolutely that's actually true that if you believe that God will raise this body from the dead, even when it has disintegrated and been eaten by the dirt, then how precious is the flesh and the blood of this living person in this moment in time that God has put me here to minister to, to serve, in other words, to feed, to clothe, to house, um, to visit in prison, to visit in hospital. There's 
an infinite value placed on this person because Jesus died for this person's body and soul. And we believe that they have an infinite and eternal, uh, that even their bones, even their hair will come back from the dead. This is what the, the Greek philosophers in Paul's day, when he got to that point, when he said, yeah, Jesus rose from the dead. They all went, you know, yeah. they were listening to him until that point. And then as soon as they come back from the dead, they're like, okay, we're done. Next, let's hear the next guy. Yeah. Uh, because the world just, they don't value human beings as much right. as they pretend to. Right. God does. Well, we end on the resurrection of the dead. Perhaps that's the best place to end tonight, yeah. Pastor Gary. Hard to, it's hard the to resurrection of the dead, the life of the world to come. Thank you, Pastor Garricky, for uh, leading us in uh, thoughts regarding how should we live and on what basis we should live. And I think the answer is quite clear. And we thank you, all our friends who have joined us tonight to, uh, to visit, to view a little bit of this talk. Um, we'll be on, we'll, we'll post this here on record so that anybody can watch it later on. Uh, but Definitely check with me if you have any questions. Uh, if, if you know Pastor Garricky, check with him for more information. God's blessings be with you guys, and um, I will see you again next time. Thanks, Colin. Thank you, Andrew.